I was asked a while back, how is it that Buddhists can say that all things are unsatisfactory when we haven't experienced all things? Actually, he said, how can you say? And I said, well, I don't say that things are unsatisfactory. That's a strange translation of the word dukkha. Dukkha means pain, suffering, stress, the whole gamut of things from very subtle levels of stress to extreme misery. But even then, how can you say that everything is dukkha? It's everything that's fabricated is dukkha. What's fabrication mean? It's a process by which we experience the world, experience ourselves. That gives you the answer right there. If you realize that everything you're going to experience has to come through the six senses, and the six senses are fabricated. In other words, there is input that comes in from outside. The world is not totally illusory. There's contact that comes in, but then we have to fashion the contact in order to make sense of it. And that process of fashioning, that's inconstant. And it's going to be stressful because it's inconstant. And that's where we pass the value judgment on it, that it's not worthy of laying claim to it as ours. The only thing that's not filtered through the six senses is unbinding. That's why it's the goal. Everything else, even the Deva worlds, the Brahma worlds, those experiences have to be filtered through form, feeling, perception, thought constructs, consciousness. And the simple fact that it's fabricated in this way, whatever the experience is, means it's going to be stressful. You can't take it as a place where you can really rest. That's one level of stress, one level of suffering. Then on top of that, there's a the question of whether we're doing it skillfully or not. Because we can have some very unskillful feelings, very unskillful perceptions, thoughts. So there are layers and layers of stress and suffering no matter where you go. The purpose of all this contemplation here is to get the mind in the path, to go to that experience that is not filtered through the senses. And does it by inducing a strong sense of sangwega. It's like those reflections we have. The chant that we have in the evening is, I'm subject to aging, illness, death, separation. I'm the owner of my actions. In the original sutta from which that comes, it goes on to say, not only am I subject to these things, everybody, everywhere you go, is subject to aging, illness, death, separation. Everybody has karma as their arbitrator, karma as their possession. In the case of the first contemplation, Buddha says that's the basis for heedfulness. Realizing you've got to get your act together. It's bad enough that we have aging, illness, and death, but our actions can make it worse. We pile unskillful thoughts, unskillful words, unskillful deeds on top of the facts of aging, illness, and death. Make it a lot harder, a lot more suffering. So reflecting on the fact that your life is marked by these things. You want to become more skillful, more heedful. But then when you reflect that it's everywhere, everybody is subject to these things, that's when you get on the path, realizing that you've got to get out. So we look at our experience as we meditate. First we get the mind to settle down. It's like a course of therapy. Therapists will have you do what's called symptom management first, just get you to calm down. Get a sense of feeling secure, 
in the present moment, and then you can analyze what's going on in the mind. So you can come to some resolution, finding out where in the mind is the mind telling itself stories that are harmful and hurtful. Why is the mind so rough with itself? It's got lots of assumptions, and many of these assumptions go way back. Back to times when we weren't very rational, weren't very knowledgeable. We were trying to make sense of things. And sometimes we have some ways of making sense of things that may have worked for the time being, but over the long run they can be really harmful. It takes a mind that's really, really still to see these things. To ferret them out. Because it's only when you recognize them can you do something about them. So we get the mind still. And then we can begin to do our analysis. What in the mind is skillful and what in the mind is not. When the Buddha talks about the processes of meditation, it's not just stilling. There's also insight. And a lot of people think that the insight has to mean you have to see things as inconstant, stressful, not self. You have to say those words to yourself. That's not the case. You just look at what you're doing and look at the consequences. And whatever you can recognize as unskillful, and realize that You've actually chosen that unskillful way of thinking, and you can think of an alternative that's not so stressful. Then whether you say inconstant stressful or not self, or no matter what you say, the fact that you see that it's stressful and it's optional, you can choose something better, the mind is going to go for the better alternative. And that's just some aspect that it hasn't seen yet that's it's still holding on to. But that's what the stillness is for, so you can dig deeper and deeper. Deeper into what? Actually deeper into the present moment. When the Buddha discusses his insights that led to awakening, they weren't insights into the world out there or the self in here. things that you can't see. They were the things that are happening right in the present moment, right in the surface of consciousness. You look at all those factors in dependent core rising. There's nothing about the world out there. And the Buddha actually discouraged people from thinking about, well, what's in here that's experiencing these things. It's just look at these things as events. Look at them as activities. Keep it at that level. But be relentlessly aware, alert, mindful, so you can notice subtle things that are happening. The mind has its micro-expressions, just as your face has micro-expressions. We have the expressions that we compose, that we use to face the world. Sometimes they're like a mask, and sometimes there's a little crack in the mask. As you move from one composed mask to another mask, little things will flit across the face. Now, some people will ignore them. Other people are sensitive to those. Well, it's the same inside the mind. The mind has its way of presenting things to itself. And then it will move on to another way of presenting things to itself, that it thinks is all right. But in between times, there can be these little dialogues, monologues, little fragments of this and that. And those will reveal a lot about what's going on. And for the most part, we tend to skim over them. We don't want to look at them. So even though they're happening right here, we can't see them. 
That's the irony of all this. It's what the Buddha is saying is, don't go looking for things behind the scenes. Just go, keep looking for what's here, right here, right now. Because this is where those processes of fabrication are happening, the ones by which we try to make sense of the world. You might ask, well, why do we try to make sense of the world? We've taken on the identity of a being. Beings have to feed. They have to make sense of the world out there so they can know what to feed on. This is both feeding in terms of physical food, feeding in terms of emotional food, mental food. The fact that you're a being means you have to feed. This again is why anything you might experience as a being is going to be stressful. What does it mean to be a being? You, you latch on to form, feeling, perceptions, thought constructs, consciousness. And when they fall apart, then you latch on to new ones, and then the new ones. You keep on going. Even at death, when you can't stay with this body anymore, there's still a sense of you as a being that's going to go on to another life. It's based on craving. And the craving lands on some place where it can become another being, keep up the process. So this is what the Buddha said is the suffering, the stress. You can't experience the world without being a being. So no matter where you go, there's going to be suffering and stress. Keep thinking about that and have confidence that there is a way out. It means looking at these processes as you're doing them. It's because the Buddha understood the processes that he saw there's going to be suffering everywhere. Wherever there's fabrication, there's going to be suffering. But it's the same way as when he saw the processes of the path. Someone once asked him, is the whole world going to be eventually awakened? He didn't answer. Half the world? Didn't answer. A third of the world? Didn't answer. Venerable Ananda was sitting by, and he was concerned that the person asking the questions might get upset. The Buddha was not answering an important question, so he pulled him aside. He said, it's like a fortress. The experienced gatekeeper sees there's one gate into the fortress, and he goes walking around the whole fortress. He doesn't see a little hole, any holes, big enough even for a cat to slip through. Now, if he's wise and experienced, he doesn't come to the conclusion that how many people are going to come in and out of the fortress. But he does know if anybody sizable is going to come in and out of the fortress, they're going to have to do it through that gate. So it's through seeing the processes that are here, right here, right now, that the Buddha was able to make these statements about all experience, because all experience has to follow these same processes. The only experience that's not subject to these things, as I said, is nirvana. Unbinding. That's why he says it's the only really worthwhile goal. So when you look at the suffering of your life, you might say, why am I suffering so much more than other people? Everybody's suffering one way or another. And over the course of the long course of time, your level of suffering has gone up and down. The level of your skill has gone up and down. And you can ask yourself, do I want to keep on doing this? Because it's potentially endless. Even when the universe collapses in the big crunch, there are places where beings can go. They say the very lowest levels of hell, the very highest Brahma levels, are not affected by the appearance or disappearance of the universe. Beings go there. And then as the universe reforms, you move down into the universe again. How many times have we done this? Countless times. How many more do we want to do it? That's a question you have to answer for yourself.